I'm pleased to welcome on stage Ariel, Ariel Zirolnik, which is a fund director at the Membership uh, Puzzle Project, which is a public research effort based in New York at NYU, and to try to do some research on media and trust, but also to try to uh, finance through um, a membership uh, initiative, uh, news fund, um, experiments in news organization that uh, might be a, uh, a good solution for media also to find a way to build a new kind of relationship with their audience. Uh, Ariel, you will be in charge of a short presentation and then you will remain on stage because you have uh, guests uh, and you will uh, be in charge of uh, moderating. You will take my job for the next maybe uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, 15 minutes of presentation and then a quick uh, 20 minute debate with two, uh, two guests. So Ariel, the floor is yours. Thank you. This it's going to work. It takes time, but it's, it will work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm here today representing the Membership Puzzle Project. We're a public research project based out of New York University in partnership with Deck Correspondent in the Netherlands. And we are especially fascinated with membership as both a revenue model, but also an editorial orientation that sees members as much more than an ATM to support the organization. We've learned as we've studied member-driven organizations around the world and seen them launch membership campaigns that you can't ask people for support until you've earned their trust first. And so our work begins not just at the moment when organizations launch membership campaigns, but also how do we imbue every stage of the process at these organizations with trust-building activities and opening up to their readers. Before we dig in, there's one baseline that I want to establish. This is something that we talk a lot about at MPP, and that is how we differentiate between subscription and membership. With subscription, paid subscribers get access to a product. It's transactional. You give your money, you get the product in return. And this model works very well from very many news organizations around the world, especially those that can operate at incredible breadth and depth, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. But where we're particularly fascinated is membership. And in membership scenarios, participating members give not just their money, but also their time, their energy, their ideas. Um, and they do this because they're joining a cause that they believe in. One of those causes that we're seeing more and more is paying to keep news free for everyone. So we see paywalls as much less common in member-driven organizations than in subscription-driven organizations. And at the heart of this relationship that they are becoming a part of is this contract between the site and its members. What do you give and what do you get in return? Oop, there we go. A few things that membership is not. As membership has exploded, particularly in the US and Western Europe, we've seen a lot of um, sort of distortions of what membership can be. Membership is not subscription by another name. It's not a brand campaign that you can turn on and off at the end of each quarter as you're trying to hit revenue targets. It's not something only American media is trying. And it's not just a think tank buzzword. It truly is a difference in the way that these organizations operate. Um, at MPP, when we launched the project in 2017, we started by studying some of those early adopters of membership and the early members of those organizations to understand what drives both of them. And this is what we heard. First off, we heard that something feels broken in the system. People became members of sites that felt like they were defying a broken status quo. They thought that joining the organization felt like a step towards beginning to fix what was broken. They wanted coverage that they can't find elsewhere. They wanted a break from the drama, the banter, and the sound bites that so dominate much of news coverage today. They wanted a user experience that made good use of their attention, that didn't try to bounce them to another section of the site within a minute of landing on the story page. And they wanted work that went deeper and with more integrity. They wanted something that offered them something different than what they were seeing on cable news or on Google News, the stories that churn every couple of minutes. Redacción, one of our grantees in Argentina, launched in 2017 with a mission to offer not just the problems that were plaguing the news cycle today, but solutions and pathways forward. And so we see amongst member-driven organizations, they are becoming an opportunity to fix what is broken in the system. Another thing we heard from members of those organizations is they wanted to be involved in meaningful ways. It wasn't token opportunities to comment on stories, but true involvement at every step of the process. 
Those organizations that found ways to offer personalized ways to be of service, not just the same pledge drives that we see in public media in the United States, but things like comment moderation, event volunteerism, fact checking, contributing code, product testers. These are the ways that these member driven organizations have opened up their operations to their members and helped them feel like a meaningful part of the organization, like they truly are part of the cause. At MPP, we're incredibly fascinated by this question of what individuals can contribute that's valuable to you and serve their motivations. So these are the six motivations that we heard again and again as we interviewed members of news sites around the world. They want to learn something new. They want an opportunity to contribute their expertise. They want to hear, they want to have a say, and they want to be heard. They want their voice out there. They want the inside scoop, and they want to understand how you work. They want to show their love for your cause because it's a topic. They appreciate your public service mission and they want to show their support for it that way. And they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And then what are your motivations as a news organization? You're trying to produce high quality work. You're trying to find audiences for that work. You're trying to identify new story ideas. And you're trying to be financially sustainable. At news organizations, especially those that are member driven, your task is to find that intersection point at which you harness these audience members' motivations to participate and they answer to the needs that your organization has. One of the best examples that we've seen of this at Membership Puzzle Project is a project from the Reveal Center for Investigative Reporting that came out of one of our early communities of practice. The Hate Report is a project that was launched in 26, 2017, uh, soon after President Trump was elected, and the purpose of it was to track the rise of hate activity in the United States. The reporters were trying to figure out how they could tap into the vast sort of audio space in which a lot of alt-right activity was happening, but they were only two of them, and so there was a limit to how many podcasts and radio shows they could listen to on any given week. What they did have is an incredibly passionate, engaged readership of their bi-weekly newsletter, The Hate Report. And so they've, in that newsletter, asked people who would be willing to volunteer to help them begin tuning into the audio space and hearing what was happening on those radio shows and podcasts. They received something like 50 offers to volunteer. They did extensive background checks on them, interviewed them, set very strong guidelines to the program with MOUs, and ended up vetting something like 27 volunteers at the end. And then they gave each of those volunteers a podcast or a radio show to listen to on a regular basis and a rubric of things to listen to and how to report back the findings. And they had a biweekly conversation with those volunteers and listening to what they were hearing on the audio, telling them what they were learning as reporters. And in the end, they ended up with what would have been a few anecdotes to illustrate points in the rise of the alt-right. They ended up with a vast trove of data. They went from three to four hours of audio research a week to dozens of hours of audio research a week from across that team of volunteers. At the end of this effort, what we heard from the reporters, Will and Aaron, was that it had opened up their eyes to a whole host of ways that they could begin working with their members in deeper ways. They envisioned themselves teaching their members how to file public records requests to help speed up the pace of organizations, or file public records requests when they get curious about something and then feed that information to the Reveal Center for Investigative Reporting if they find something interesting. And so these organizations that do what Will and Aaron did, that found a way to responsibly, but also enthusiastically, allow members past the gatekeeper are the ones that we see succeed. They begin to identify members as not just revenue generators in their membership fees, but also money saving because in-kind contributions like the research that all of those volunteers did have financial value for news organizations. They made the mindset that we see member-driven organizations needing to make, which is they went from thinking about their audience members as a liability that they had to be managed, the trolls in the comment section, the people harassing your customer service representatives, to assets that could expand the scope and impact of your work. And we're seeing more and more news organizations begin to change their perception of their readers that way. Another thing that we heard from members of these early organizations is they wanted greater transparency. They wanted organizations to be real with them. Again and again, organizations, members of organizations can only name maybe one or two people at the top of the organization. They did not know who their readers were. So what that told us at MPP is that we can do a lot to make ourselves much less institutional, to make ourselves more human. In the US at least, journalists are trusted somewhere in the same range as used car salesmen, lawyers, and real estate agents based on polls that have come out in the last couple of years. Especially in this era when news organizations are increasingly being called fake news, we need to find ways to inoculate ourselves against that kind of accusation. And being authentic and transparent in our work is one very powerful, but also one very simple way to begin to address this crisis of trust that we're seeing today. 
These are some of the ways that we heard members request greater transparency. They've asked for things like greater, greater clarity on organizational financial health. They want to know the people who are involved in the organization, their motivations, their career paths. Where were they before they were your reporter? They want to know what your priorities and your agenda are, and not in the bias agenda that people so often lob at news organizations, but what are you there to do? What does the day-to-day -day drive of the organization look like? What are the processes? How do you decide what stories to cover? How do you decide how to respond to criticism? They want to know how those decisions are made. They want to understand how you set your pricing. They want to know how you plan to respond to criticism, and they want transparency when you screw up about how that happened. And they want to understand your organizational culture. When you look at this list like this, it sounds like quite a lot. But if we can sort of change the mindset of seeing like we have to have a wall between readers because otherwise they might sabotage the process, this becomes much more natural and becomes a very easy way to operate. And in fact, it opens your organization up to a whole host of information coming in from the community. This reader covenant here, I know it's very small text, I apologize for that, but this is the reader covenant from the Daily Maverick in South Africa. And the thing I wanna point out is just at the top there, they say, these are our promises to you and what we expect from you in return. And it's a very simple statement, but it's a very powerful one because by leading the reader covenant that way, they signal a two-way relationship right off the bat. They are not just vowing to do accurate, truthful reporting, but they are also saying that they expect certain things from you in return. If you go further down, they're expecting civility when speaking to other readers. They're expecting civility to their reporters. They're expecting you to support the work financially if you can, but they don't have a paywall because they understand that the information is worth it to you even if you can't pay for it. So their reader covenant sort of sets that tone. Another very different example is another one of our grantees at Membership Puzzle Project. It's the Devil Strip in Akron, Ohio. They're a local news organization. And they say here at the bottom, um, we are advocates for the city of Akron and allies to its people. So we may be cheerleaders, but that won't keep us from challenging the city's flaws. What's the point of being part of the community if we can't help make it a better place for human beings? This is a really simple statement, but it says a lot about the way that they approach the city. And so when they trumpet something, some good news for the city, and people accuse them of being cheerleaders, they will point to this and say, we never said we weren't. Or when they come down and criticize a program that they previously reported on and people say, well, you're trying to bring down the city of Akron, they can point to this again and say, we never promised to only paint the rosiest picture possible. It's a very clear articulation of where they want to situate themselves in the city. Another example of financial transparency comes from La Silla Vacia in Colombia. They publish not just their sources of revenue, as you can see here, but also their expenditures. So they say publicly that 53% of their revenue goes to journalist salaries. They articulate how much of it is spent on tech, how much of it is spent on office space and administrative costs. And here they show how much of their money comes from international NGOs, how much of it comes from their members, how much of it comes from events. And this is really important because particularly in societies where the news organizations have to be receiving overseas money to support their operations, they are very vulnerable to accusations being driven by a foreign agenda. With La Silla Vacia, by clarifying what percentage of their revenue is coming from outside the country, they can show that they are not dependent on that foreign money. Yes, it is part of the pie, but they show what part of the pie it is, and Colombians can see that much more of their revenue comes from within the country, from people that are trying to build a better society just like them. Another thing we heard from these members is that they requested that news organizations make good use of their attention. We've all had that experience of going to a news site and trying to read a story, and on one end of the screen there's advertisements for belly tea, and on another end of the screen there is a video that's popping up and covering half of the text you're trying to read, and then before you can even get halfway through the story you're being bombarded with advertisements to subscribe. And you leave the site because you can't even get there and do what you came to do. So we heard again and again from, from members, they wanted something very simple. They wanted to be able to come to the site and read your story. They wanted to be able to share your story. And if they came to give you money, for you to make it easy for them to do that. It's a really simple request, but it's one that news organizations have been quite slow to adapt to. Um, we have here a mock-up from the correspondent when they were still running their crowdfunding campaign. Um, and you can see here, even this is sort of the aesthetic of their work, and it's very calm, it's very, base, it's very simple you're going to scroll through and you're gonna be able to get to the bottom of a story without having been bombarded with seven different things. This is a really simple thing, but it's also really key. Oop. Is there another way to change this? 
Anybody else have control of this? I think it died. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so another thing, the last thing we heard from members that we studied is they wanted appropriate asks. Many member-driven organizations are building membership landing pages that look like this. There's 13 different tiers. There's a different price point with a different benefit at every stage of it. And you come to the site and you feel like you're taking a multiple choice test. Um, we heard from members again and again. They just wanted to understand very simply what it was that you wanted them to do to support them and what it meant to support them. So membership in news is obviously something quite new. That's why I'm up here today. But member-driven movements in other industries have been around for much, much longer. And so as a public research project at MPP, we are not just studying our own industry, but we've invested a lot of time and effort in understanding how membership has succeeded in industries beyond our own. When we did our research that was published in April with the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas, we studied all of these different analogous spaces that are driven by members. We studied alternative currencies, open source software, environmental co-ops, um, public broadcasting, citizen science, church groups. A researcher even went to Burning Man to understand why people would invest so much time and money to building these crazy structures in the desert that last a week. And we heard a few commonalities across all of these organizations, whether they were something in the tech space or something as simple as a neighborhood garden cooperative. We heard that there is deep value in listening, testing, and being fascinated with what members value. And what we took away from this at MPP is that we need to find ways to be as fascinated with our readers, the way that they learn, the way that they process information, as much as we are with the policies and politicians that we spend days chewing over. We need to begin to think about our readers as something as interesting to us as the member-driven, as organizations outside of news already do. We also saw that these organizations sold much more than a product or a cause. They managed to help their members feel connected to something larger in the community, to part of a larger cause. Membership was a way for those members to, members to restore what feels broken in society. So those organizations who could articulate what it meant to support them and how it went into the broader community made a really strong difference in the retention of those members and the strength of the organization. That fascination that I mentioned before it also enabled these organizations to understand the motivations, the different abilities, the different capacities that members might have, and to offer flexible means of participation. Some people just want to give their money and step back and trust you to go and do the work, but others want to be volunteers. They want to go knock on doors for you, or they want a table at an event for you, or they want to work with your reporter to understand an esoteric topic. And so those organizations that do make that transition to fascination with readers, then are much more equipped to offer these flexible means of participation because they understand who the members are. Another one that we heard again and again, and this is incredibly relevant to where we are in the news cycle, um, the news industry today, as we've seen many of these countries experience meteoric growth and then rapid crashes, is that these member-driven organizations beyond news grew at a human scale. In member-driven organizations, it's really important for organizations to not grow beyond their capacity to serve their members. If members expect a relationship and you grow so rapidly that re relationship deteriorates, you're going to lose those members, you're going to break your trust with them, and it's much harder to get them back once you've gotten to that point. So growing at a human scale allows you to very methodically build that relationship and build your capacity. And we've even seen some organizations strategically choose to limit their growth in order to maintain the strength of that relationship. What does this look like in practice? One of the most recent research reports that we did at MPP was on making journalism more memberful. Ariel, mm -hmm. I will ask you just to try to finish on this slide, then you will have guests, and then you can maybe continue the discussion with them. Otherwise, okay. it will be okay. too long. All right. <laughs> it's only been 12 minutes. Um, so um, I will just say this one thing then. What are memberful routines? Um, when organizations go from one-off projects to routine ways of operating on a daily basis, that is when they imbue their work with this sort of memberful way of working. The memberful routines are grounded in the belief that journalism is not an esoteric art, but much of the work can be taught to those who are your readers, who are your members, so that they can participate in the work with you as well. They also don't only exist in membership models. And in that report, we looked at a number of subscription-driven organizations, including Nice Matan here in France, to understand how they involved audience members in the process at every step of the way. Um, we saw involvement at all four of these stages. And when we bring the panelists on stage, we'll hear a little bit more about how membership plays out and everything from the planning stage to post-publication. 
Um, and these are some of the ways that we've had seen effective memberful routines around the world. The last thing that I wanted to close on is some of the early membership lessons that we've learned. Membership in news is very new. MPP has been around only since 2017, and there have been a few organizations working even before us, but still, it's been studied less than a decade, and so we're just beginning to learn some really concrete lessons around it. And here are a few takeaways that we've had. Um, membership requires more than the traditional marketing funnel. Um, with a marketing funnel, when you convert, that's where the relationship ends. You race to the bottom. But with membership, that's often where the relationship begins, and that's where it begins to widen and deepen. And so we need more than the traditional marketing funnel, and we need tools that support that. The traditional sales CRM is not set up to support membership, and this is something that's holding back the membership industry, is that we don't have tools to support the organizations yet in the way that we need to. We need new jobs. Deck Correspondent in the Netherlands has a conversations editor, an engagement editor, and a verification editor. And Liz, who will be on stage in a bit, has a job that very few news organizations have. We also saw that they offer flexible means of participation and that that increases conversions. And we heard as we tried to measure success that loyalty came up again and again and again. And so after years of being obsessed with growth, one of the things we learned is we need to find a way to properly measure loyalty because this is the North Star metric for membership. Okay, thank you, Ariel. And I will ask you to do the two guests, maybe to join Ariel on the stage. Thank you. Thank you.